This is part two. Last week, if you weren't here, I encourage you to go to our YouTube channel. Hopefully, it'll be up by now <laughs> for part one. But today, I'm going to start out with Psalm 24, verse 7 through 9. <clears throat> it's interesting that we sang this in one of our songs this morning. Fling wide the gates. Open the ancient doors and the great king will come in. Who is this great king? He is the Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, victorious in battle. Fling wide the gates. Open the ancient doors and the great king will come in. This is a prophetic word for today. The Lord is telling us to open the gates of our hearts in a way we've never experienced before and allowing him to have access to every corner, every crease in our hearts, that he would make the way straight for his coming on the earth. And I, as seeking the Lord, came upon this prophetic word from a gentleman named Chris G. Bennett. It was written a few days ago, and he says, I received this word two years ago. Since then, things have changed, changed considerably. I agree with that. Two years ago is very different from today. He says, read the original, then read my update of what the Lord is saying about the open door today, August 2021. So this is the vision two, week, two years ago. My wife recently used a picture of a gateway, which as I looked at it, a warrior angel stood in the center of it. Then a friend sent us this picture of another gateway, and again, the same warrior angel appeared in the center of it. I asked the Lord what I was seeing. This is the door to revival. So why the angel? You're not ready to enter this place. Hmm. The Lord says, too many people still want it on their own terms. They want to limit my spirit. They want to control things. They're scared of offending, scared of upsetting the tithers, of interrupting the finances, of losing them. They still haven't grasped my provision, my timing, my agenda. They haven't believed my promises. Revival is coming, he said, but only to those prepared for it. Only those who have and will continue to pay the price. In fact, the Lord continued, the coming revival will define my remnant army who, like Gideon's few before them, will take every place they walk upon. I remembered the verse given to us as a couple months ago, Genesis 13, 17, arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. And Joshua 1, 1 3, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. Do y'all believe that? That's a promise for us people. Wherever we put our foot, God is saying we will possess it for the kingdom of God. Okay? So, he says, yes, says the Lord. Those whom I appoint and use to steward revival shall reap a vast harvest and will receive their reward from me. But those who seek and have revival only on their own terms shall receive all the reward they shall ever get from men. So how long will your angel stay in the gateway, Lord, until I tell him to stand aside and allow you through, said the Lord. Get yourselves ready, and in a very short while I will send my spirit with the revival you seek then you will see my glory. Then you will see signs, wonders, and the miracles you seek. Then you will reap the promised harvest, says our God. So that's a prophetic word two years ago. Certainly that's been my heart for eight years. But you know, I had set aside that vision because it seemed as if I couldn't go through the desert experience by myself. 
And I can tell you, I can't do that now. But I know that God has a remnant. Those who are truly faithful to the call, those who are ready to walk through the door, those who are so wholeheartedly committed to the vision and to this coming revival that everything else takes second, actually last place in their lives. So now hear the word of the Lord in 2021. This is a follow-up. The Lord took me back to the same door, to the same open door that he'd shown me two years ago as before. A warrior angel stood in the center of it. Now, however, the warrior angel stood aside as I approached, as if ushering me through the door to whatever lay behind it. As I got closer, I saw fire, fiercely burning fire, almost a furnace, in fact. As I looked closer, I could see that it wasn't real fire. Rather, it was the impression of fire. I was seeing it spiritually rather than literally. It was the fire of revival, Holy Spirit revival. The angel spoke to me. This is indeed revival fire, the same fire that you saw from a distance the other day. This is now the open door to revival ready and waiting for you to step through. The Lord's fire of revival is burning fiercely and awaits you to join him in the sacred work of stewarding his revival. One such has never been seen before. The word of God tells us the parable of the King's Supper in Luke 14, verse 15 through 24. This has become reality in this revival. Verse 21 is your key verse in that scripture. It says, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. This revival will call and bring in many who would not previously have even looked at the church. With this, the angel disappeared, and I heard the familiar, gentle voice of the Lord say, Call my people to revival. The fields are white unto harvest, but the laborers are few. I am seeking those who are willing, and I will use them all mightily for my kingdom. So I leave you with this today. Come, whoever is willing, and the Lord will use you in the great harvest. Come. The Lord calls you, and whom he calls, he equips. So don't worry what you can do for him, because he will be with you, and he will enable you to do things beyond anything you can imagine. Just come. This certainly confirms everything the Lord has been showing me and everything I've been preaching from this pulpit. Jesus is calling the remnant to be partakers of the coming revival. So, as mentioned in this prophetic word, I wanted to look back to the words of Jesus that he quoted in Luke chapter 14 for direction for all of us because we all have a part to play in this revival if we're committed to the mission. We're called into God's army, and we are commissioned for the mission. And the great commission is to bring in the harvest in simple terms, okay? So Luke 14, verse 1 through 6 says this. We're going to go through this scripture, and we're going to see how it applies to our life today and what it says about us in this coming revival, how we can be a part of this great call of God. Amen? Does anybody want to do this? Who wants to be in this remnant army besides me? Come on, Nikki. I know you do. All right. Then pay attention closely because God, Jesus is going to talk to us, okay? I don't have to say a lot because God's word speaks for itself. So it says, one Sabbath when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, He was being carefully watched, carefully watched by the Pharisees. There in front of them, you know, they're not fair, you see. So there in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? There was a big issue with the Pharisees that you were not supposed to lift a finger to help anybody or do anything. That was man's tradition. That was not God's, the heart of God's law. God's law was honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. 
And there were a few things you were not allowed to do, but there was a lot of things you could do. Like the priests had to work in the temple, right? They had to burn offerings and change the showbread and do all kinds of things on the Sabbath day. But the Pharisees had taken it to the nth degree that God never intended. So they, they were sitting there watching Jesus to see what he was going to do with this guy. Jesus asked the Pharisees, because he knew what they were thinking, and experts in the law, the lawyers. You know there's no law. No, I'm just kidding. Um, there will be a few lawyers in heaven. <laughs> the ones that are saved. Okay, so Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. I'm sure Jesus sat there for a minute and watched and waited to hear what they had to say, but nobody would speak up. So he's taking hold of the man. He healed him and sent him on his way. And then he asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say because of course they would have. When, you know, because while the Pharisees were there waiting to see what Jesus would do, whether or not he would break the quote unquote law of the Sabbath or not, Jesus, what he did is he threw down the gauntlet. Now that word came to me as a word I never use in my natural living. I don't use that word, throw down the gauntlet. So I had to look it up. What does that mean? And it means to, to make a challenge. And it also is a, uh, a symbol of uh, when you're challenging someone to a duel. So Jesus literally throws down the gauntlet. He already knows what they think. They're thinking it's unlawful to heal on the Sabbath day. They think he's a heretic. But he throws down the gauntlet. He was challenging them. He, he was challenging them, not to a duel, but he was challenging their r religious thought. And he says to them, if your child falls into a hole, are you not going to lift it up? If you're a donkey, an ox, wouldn't you do something to save that animal? He's challenging their thinking and their priorities. Number one, he's challenging their priorities because they had put the law about above law, above love. All right. And we have to look at ourselves today. What are our priorities? We're not stuck in the law. We don't know. I don't see a lot of Christians even honoring the Sabbath to keep it holy. But Jesus is challenging us today with our priorities because their priorities were upside down. They were so religious that they were missing the mark. And God is calling us to look at our priorities today, just like he was challenging them. Because if a child or an ox fell into a well on the Sabbath day, that would be a, that would be a crisis situation any day of the week. But under the Pharisaical regulations, it was against the law to do any work, and it would be breaking the law, just trying to rescue that animal or child. So he's challenging us. You know, folks, we all have thinking that comes from our world and, and, our, and our, um, you know, what's valuable in our hearts. And God is calling us to look at these things and put them on the altar and reevaluate our priorities because priorities matter. Because our actions speak louder than our words. I'm telling you, there's a world out there of people who need Jesus. They need salvation. I'm going to tell you, when, I, you know, when you are on fire for God, you're, you look at people different. You look at people differently. When I was a baby Christian and I realized I had almost, I was living my life on the way to hell and God rescued me. Let me tell you, when I looked at people, I saw every person and I thought, you're either heaven bound or hell bound. You're either lost or saved. I look at every little child and I, I think this child is destined to either spend eternity in heaven or dis destined to live in hell. When it's your passion to get people to heaven, you're going to do something about it. You know what I did about it? I started a Christian school with no grandiose ideas about it, but just simply to rescue the children. When your priorities are right, it's going to show up in your actions. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
let me tell you, uh, for years and years, I worshiped and I went to church and I, you know, at times taught, taught, taught Sunday school and th things like that. But I got involved in the dance ministry and I was danced on this stage. And I'm telling you, it got to the place where I thought I could never go to church anywhere else because where else could I dance in church? And I love to worship God with my whole body, soul, and spirit. I love to express, I'm Italian. Hello, we talk with our body. And so for me, dancing is simply talking to God with my arms and legs. And now I can't do much of that anymore. I can do the arms, but the legs have gone. But you know, it came to the place where I was in church all the time. I was at the church practicing, practicing, preparing for this event, preparing for that event. And I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit had to bring me uh, to my knees because I realized I was so busy at church, I wasn't really doing the things that God tells us we're supposed to do. Feed the hungry, visit the sick, do the things that matter to him. We can be so full of Jesus, full of churchianity that we miss the mark, people. You know, Dwight, God told me and Dwight we had to stop worshiping worship. Folks, we can't worship anyone but the one we're to be worshiping. So every one of us has to look at our priorities. I had to look at my priorities. What matters? And I'll tell you what Jesus says. It, whatever you've done to the least of these, my brethren, you've done to me. People are his priority. If we don't have time for people, we're missing the mark, people. Amen. Luke 14, verse 7 through 11, he said, When he noticed how the guest picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, hey, give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place because that's all that's left. But when you are invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. Motives matter. And I, I, you know what? I'm going to get a t-shirt that says that. I think I should get a t-shirt that says that, right? Motives matter. Motives matter to God. What our motives are. And we have to ask ourselves, what is the motive for what we do? You know, when I was worshiping God on this platform as a dancer, my motive was, I just love God. I just want to worship him. And I love worshiping him that way. But there are people who would want to be on that dance floor because they want to be seen. They want to be looked at. They want to show off their gift and talent. Well, luckily, I didn't have too much of a gift or talent. No training. So that wasn't my problem. <laughs> I didn't have a problem there. <laughs> but we have to look at our motives because Jesus said, well, in Corinthians, it says, Paul the Apostle says, even if you give up your body to be burned in the fire as a martyr, but you don't have love, it counts for nothing. It counts for nothing. So motive matters. And with these Pharisees, they were famous for wearing their garments as an evidence of their righteousness and holiness. And they sought the approval of men. So G Jesus is talking to these Pharisees who want to be at the head of the table. They want everybody to see how holy and righteous they are. He knows the motive of their heart. But he tells them, hey, you want to be lifted up here on earth? In heaven, if you make it, you're going to be seated at the bottom of the totem pole. Amen? But he who humbles himself will be exalted. I do believe, and I've taught this, humility is the number one character in a person that qualifies them for the greater things of God's eternal kingdom. And what does he say? He says, he who humbles himself will be exalted. God will lift him up. Why? Because humble people are servants. The greatest in the kingdom 
is a servant here on earth, people. And if our motive is not to serve, then it counts for nothing in God's eternal kingdom. And, you know, the world is looking at the church, and honestly, for years, for decades, all they can say is the church is filled with hypocrites. And I have to agree with them. Not everybody's a hypocrite, but a hypocrite is someone who says they believe in Jesus, but they don't live it. They don't act like it. Jesus said, the Bible says that God, Jesus gave up the glories of heaven and came to earth to be a servant. And we are, we must be that way if we're going to experience this if we're going to be used for God's purpose in the earth today, which, by the way, is revival. God is bringing in a great harvest, and we want to be there. We have to look at our hearts. What is our motive for what we do? If we're in the praise team, if we preach in the pulpit, believe me, I'm always willing to give up this pulpit. Y'all don't belong to me, and I don't belong to me. And when Jesus says, I want this person to be here, believe me, he'll be here. Next week, Jerry Williamson will be here, Dr. Jerry from Go to Nations, and we'll be so blessed to have him in the pulpit next week. So I hope you'll come and honor him with your presence. But we need to look at our motives. Uh, Luke 14, uh, 12 through 14. And this is where we get into what's going to be happening in this revival. This is where he said in that prophetic word, look to this scripture. This is the key. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So we have to ask ourselves, who do we associate with? <clears throat> because God is not a respecter of persons. He loves the unlovely. He loves those who are what we would call the dregs of society. And we have to ask ourselves, do I love those people? If I love them, is there anything I can do to help them? And I'm not talking about a handout. But I'm talking about investing in people that come our way. And obviously, I can't go downtown and go to every homeless person and invite them to my house to spend the night. I have done that. Debbie and I made a way for a homeless woman, completely homeless, to have a, a place to sleep, a clean bed, everything she needed. We got her clothes. We even got her a hanging thing to put them on. And do you know we came back to the place that she had left. So we have stepped out, and we have reached out. And God knows that, right? We're not responsible for the outcome. We're only responsible for what we do. But we are all going to meet people along life's highway that you are the only example of Jesus they'll ever meet. And that's the question. Are you looking at them as a human being, a soul who Jesus died for, we, it's called love, people. It's called love. And that is going to determine what you do. And I'm, I really believe that is in the coming days, we're going to see a lot of desperate people. And we must be open and ready to lay down our agenda. Lay down our agenda. What we think is so important. And be available to meet the needs of someone else. Now, I love what Mother Teresa once said. Someone asked her, how were you able to do what you did? This one woman went to India as a nun. And when she saw the poverty, the people laying in the gutters dying in Calcutta, India, she decided to do something about it. And when she died, there were 10,000 nuns around the world taking care of the destitute. And you know, when they asked her that question, how were you able to do that? She says, I wasn't able. God is able. I was simply available. And we must avail ourselves to God. 
We must make ourselves available to God to be used in this coming uh, tsunami of God's grace that's coming on the earth. Amen? So we need to ask ourselves, do you walk away from those who are offensive because they're just too much trouble? Um, Because Jesus didn't. Jesus didn't do that. He's calling for a people who are truly surrendered to him so that he can use us in miraculous ways. Luke 14, chapter, uh, verse 15 through 24 says, When one of those at the table with him, so it was a Pharisee probably, said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything's now ready. But they all alike began making excuses. The first one said, I I have just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen. So he's a rich guy. He's got five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another one said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to the master. When the master of the house became angry, And ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there's still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. So, you know, we're living in the very end of the church age. And again, all these people who had a lot of money, they just bought a field. One just bought a bunch of oxen. Well, the other one just got married. Again, their priorities. It's all about priorities. And right now, I mean, Dwight and I are watching this British BBC Uh, TV show called um, Call the Midwives. And every single show, they're showing a baby being born. And man, you see the woman going through labor. And if anybody's ever had a baby, there's this period of labor. And it's called labor because the woman has to work at it to make that baby come out. And you need help. That's what the midwives do. And uh, But in every single delivery, there's a period of transition where the woman wants to kill her husband and scream and yell at the doctors and say cuss words that she would never say in public. That period of transition is the most difficult. And that's the place we are in right now in world history, in church history. We are in a stage of transition. We are in that period of time where The church age is coming to an end. We are in labor, giving birth to the kingdom of God. Now, between that, there's going to be a seven-year period of the Great Tribulation, which I hope we won't be here, God willing. I won't be here, I promise you. But right now, it's a rough time. It's hard. The period of transition is a very difficult time to be in. But also, out of that period of transition in labor, a baby is born. New life is brought into the world. And this is that time in history where new life is coming forth and the church is giving birth to new babies into the kingdom of God. So this is our priority. If we will get our eyes on Where we are in history, in church history, knowing that the time is short, we will have our priorities straight. Amen? I want to tell you, when a woman goes into labor, she can't stop it. And and we can't stop this. It's it's a God thing. It's God's timing. It's God's provision. So God is not impressed with crowds. He looks at the heart to see those who are truly his disciples Luke 14, verse 25 through 33 says this. As massive crowds, massive crowds followed Jesus. He turned to them and said, when you follow me as my disciple, you must put aside your father, your mother, your wife, your sisters, your brothers. It will even seem as though you hate your own life. This is the price you'll pay 
to be considered one of my followers. My goodness, that's a lot different than what the church has been preaching for about 30 years. Massive crowds. Massive crowds, people. But if you want to be a disciple of Christ, you must put aside. In other versions, it says you must hate your mother. Of course, God doesn't tell us to hate. We're supposed to honor our mother and father. We're supposed to love everyone. But we must put aside all of those things that we consider to be of vital importance. This is the price you'll pay to be considered one of my followers. Anyone who comes to me must be willing to share my cross and experience it as his own, or he cannot be considered to be one of my disciples. So don't follow me without considering what it will cost you. For who would construct a house before first sitting down to estimate the cost to complete it? Otherwise, he may lie, lay the foundation and not be able to finish. The neighbors will ridicule him, saying, look at him. He started to build, but he couldn't complete it. Have you ever heard of a commander who goes out to war without first sitting down with strategic planning to determine the strength of his army to win the war against a stronger opponent? If he knows he doesn't stand a chance of winning the war, the wise commander will send out delegates to ask for the terms of peace. Likewise, you, unless you surrender all to me, giving up all you possess, you cannot be one of my disciples. That's a heavy word, isn't it? It's a heavy word. But that is the remnant. The remnant is made up of those who are surrendered and have surrendered everything for God's kingdom. You know, Dwight and I, you may think, well, Connie, you never did. Oh, I want to tell you, I did. You know, people are afraid to surrender all because they think that means you don't have anything. Oh, but that's not true. Because when you give God all you are and all you have, he gives you all he is. And if he can trust you with finances, he's going to give you more. Dwight and I don't have what we have because we stored it up. We're the only people I know in, my, in our income category that do not have a 401k. We've never had a savings account. When I see my bank account recently actually have money in it, I don't, I, oh my gosh, I got to do something with this money. I'm not going to go buy Bitcoin. I'm not going to go buy gold and silver, but I am going to put it in God's kingdom. I'm like, oh my gosh, I've got to do something. I've got too much money in my account. Now, this is a, a new thing for me because we've always paid out our tithes and lots of offerings, missions, and helping people. But there's a time to reap and there's a time to sow. I should put that first. There's a time to sow and then there's a time to reap. Dwight and I are reaping a harvest of a lifetime of giving. You can't outgive God. You can't. It's impossible. Because if you sow a seed, it's going to bring forth a harvest. Thank you for that, Rocky. Rocky prayed that over me today. Now, we have to ask ourselves, are you a follower of Christ or just a fan? You know, the Beatles had fans. I don't know who the new people are. Because I must live on a different planet. I'm not a fan of anyone. Except Jesus. But I'm more than a fan. I'm a follower. I am a follower who has given my life to him, for him, and for his kingdom. There's a difference between a fan and a follower. You know, he had a lot of fans. 
people that chased him all over the countryside wanting, uh, wanting him to heal somebody in their family. They wanted something from him. But when the rubber hits the road, who was standing at the cross when he was on that cross? It was his mother and the disciple John and some of Mary's relatives. The women and Mary Magdalene. It, that was the core group who stood before that cross while he was suffering on the cross. And on the day he rose into heaven, ascended into heaven, there were 500 people there. 500 out of the multitudes who followed him. The churches are filled with people. Not ours. But most churches are filled with people. And if they were all true followers of Christ, we would have revival breaking forth in the streets of Jacksonville now. Now. So we have to ask ourselves, are you a fan or a follower? Have you taken up your cross and crucified everything that you treasure, especially number one, first and foremost, your own will. Have you ever come to that place called Gethsemane where you, maybe you didn't sweat blood like Jesus did, but you laid it there and you said, God, I can't do this. I don't want to do this, but nevertheless, not my will, not what I want to do, not what I want, but what you want. Have you come to that place? Because if you haven't, you need to. That is the place of true surrender. It's the place where you go from being a fan to a follower. Yes. Hallelujah. It's a great place to be. But you will face a cross. You will face the cross. You will face the place where you must nail your feelings, your dreams, your what you think is so important. You must put it to death so that God can give you what he wants, his purpose, his vision for your life. And there is no road around it, people. There's no way to get what God wants to give you. There's no way apart from this. There's no easy way. There's no... Well, God must have a different plan for my life. It's, the, it's a bed of roses. No, no. There's no bed of roses for a true believer. It is a place of struggling as Jacob struggled with the angel of God. He struggled with God. It's a place of struggle. It's a place of transition. It's a place where you want to kill everybody around you when you're having a baby. Stay away from women when they're in transition. Terrible place to be. But God is working in the hearts of people, and he's bringing us all to this place where, you know what? We can look around and say, uh, the world as we've known it is never going to come back. Now, you know why it's so easy to get people saved in third world countries? Because their, their normal is hell on earth. They don't have doctors. They don't have hospitals. They don't have hot and cold running water. They sleep on dirt floors. Their children get a cold and die from it. They don't have clean, hot and cold running water. They don't have air conditioning and electricity. They don't have any hope for the future that it will ever get better or it be any better for their own children. So, yeah, it's easy to get people saved in third world countries, simple. I mean, it's so easy. Just present the gospel. They're ready for it because this world has nothing on, they have nothing on this world that they want to hold on to. But you know, it's very hard for rich men to enter the kingdom of heaven. And in the United States, we have been a rich nation and we have become self-sufficient and independent. And we think we can plan out our lives and it's all going to go according to plan. But God is saying no more, no more, no more. No more. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. We are at, he is standing at the door. He is waiting for the church to rise up into its full inheritance. 
to be a walking, talking G army of Jesus out there. Amen. To properly display who he is in all of his glory. Amen. We are not wimps. You know, Jesus is coming for a glorious church. Not a defeated church. Not a fearful church. Not a bunch of people who whine and complain. And oh my gosh, and my whole, oh my 401k is not going to be worth anything. You're right. It's not. So get it out of there and give it away to the poor. Jesus is saying, stop hoarding your wealth. Give it to the poor. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Connie, you're preaching something. Really, no other prophet saying that. <laughs> They're not as, well, you know what? I might get stoned when I walk out this door. And maybe everybody will quit listening to my YouTube videos. But you know what? It's okay. I'm responsible to tell you that God has shown me. He is looking for a people who have surrendered everything to him. And that means your future. You want what the future is that God has for you. An eternal kingdom that it will never end. It is glorious. And I'm going to tell you, when your eyes get on that, he'll begin to give you revelation of how wonderful it is. And you won't care one hoot about what's on this earth anymore. But until we are taken out of here, we're called to occupy the land and expand God's kingdom on the earth. And we do that by living the life that Christ lived, a life of service and servanthood, a life of humility that we love the unlovely. This is the call of God. That's how revival's coming. And then, you know, Those who are unwilling to pay the price of discipleship are like worthless salt. Unable to affect anything or anyone. Luke 14, 25. Well, I got that wrong. Through 35. No, through 34. Salt is good for seasoning. But if salt were to lose its flavor, how could it ever be restored? It will never be useful again, not even fit for the soil or the manure pile. If you have ears to hear, opened by the Spirit of God, then hear the meaning of what I have said and apply it to yourselves. You know, I had a hard time this morning wanting to give this message. I was in a place really I thought, I can't do this. I really can't, God. I told him that sitting right there. I could not deliver this message. I had Rocky pray for me. This is a tough message, but it's the word of God. It's the word of God. I am pleading with believers. I am pleading with you if you are considered a believer. You consider yourself a believer in Christ. Are you a fan? Are you truly a disciple? Because Jesus has told us what that means. Time is short. This is the day to release his power on the earth. He is looking for those who will walk in the dominion and authority that he's given them. He wants to demonstrate his kingdom power on this earth through us. We are the generation who will walk in his power on the earth he is looking for those who will ask of him and he will give us the nations as our inheritance. He is looking for those who will empty themselves of anything that would defile them so that they could release his light into this dark world. He is looking for a remnant who call on him and say, Lord, lift us up where we belong. Let us pray. Heavenly Father. We come before your throne of grace with a grateful heart for all you do and all you have done for each and every one of us as we have walked on this journey called life. We acknowledge that apart from you, we can do nothing. Our eyes are on you as we cry out to you for revival. We are desperate for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit in our lives. We are desperate for the fire of God to cleanse us, to purify our hearts and our motives, and give us the heart of compassion and mercy that Jesus has. Lord, help us to relinquish our rights, 
to surrender our weapons and to cling to the cross of Jesus. Help us to crucify our flesh. Help us to renounce all sin and the love of these things of this world. God, we are helpless and hopeless without you. We want to be part of this remnant army that brings in the harvest of souls into your eternal kingdom. And we cry out to you, come Holy Spirit. Let the Spirit and the bride say, come Lord Jesus. Let your kingdom come and rule and reign in our hearts, in our lives, in our homes, in this church. Let your kingdom come in us and through us. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.